This is the final episode of our extended story on Thumb Wind's End of the Road in Michigan podcast, A Fortnight in the Wilderness by Alexis de Tocqueville. In 1831, two 26-year-old, French aristocrats, Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont, decided to strike out, in what today's terms, would be the ultimate road trip. Namely, traveling overland from Detroit, to the last settlement in the Northwest Territories, to Saginaw, Michigan. This is the fifth part of our series. When we last left Alex and Gustav, they had traveled from Pontiac to the Flint River to a place known then as the Grand Traverse. Here they obtained the services of two native guides to complete their journey to Saginaw. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's tale from the end of the road. Part 6, The Wilderness Hamlet of Saginaw We went out very early and the first objects that struck us were our Indians, rolled up in their blankets near the door, and sleeping by the side of their dogs. This was our first daylight view of the village of Saginaw, which we had come so far to see. A small, cultivated plain, bounded on the south by a beautiful and gently flowing river, on the east, west, and north by the forest, constitutes at present the territory of the embryo city. Near us was a house whose character announced the easy circumstances of its owner. It was the one in which we had passed the night. A similar dwelling was visible at the other extremity of the clearing. Between them, and on the skirts of the woods, two or three log houses were half hidden in the foliage. On the opposite side of the river stretched the prairie, resembling a boundless ocean on a calm day. A column of smoke was curling towards the sky. Looking whence it came, we discovered the pointed forms of two or three wigwams, which scarcely stood out from the grass of the prairie. A plow that had upset, its oxen galloping off by themselves to the field, and a few half-wild horses, completed the picture. On every side, the eye searches in vain for a gothic spire, the moss-covered porch of a clergyman's house, or a wooden cross by the roadside. These venerable relics of our religion have not been carried into the wilderness. It contains as yet nothing to remind one of the past, or of the future. No consecrated home even for those who are no more. Death has not had time to claim his domain, nor to have his close marked out. Here, man still seems to steal into life. Several generations do not assemble around the cradle to utter hopes often deceitful, and rejoicings which the future often belies. The child's name is not inscribed in the register of the city. Religion does not mingle its affecting ceremonies with the solicitude of the family. A woman's prayers, a few drops sprinkled on the infant's head by its father's hand, quietly open to it the gates of heaven. The village of Saginaw is the furthest point inhabited by Europeans to the northwest of the vast peninsula of Michigan. It may be considered as an advanced post, a sort of watchtower, placed by the whites in the midst of the Indian nations. European revolutions, the continual noisy clamor of politics, reach this spot only at rare intervals, and as the echoes of a sound, the source of which the ear can no longer distinguish nor comprehend. Sometimes an Indian stops on his journey to relate, in the poetical language of the wilderness, some of the sad realities of social life, sometimes a newspaper dropped out of a hunter's knapsack, or only the sort of indistinct rumor which spreads one knows not how, and which seldom fails to tell that something strange is passing in the world. Once a year a vessel steams up the Saginaw to join this stray link to the great European chain which now binds together the world. She carries to the new settlement the products of human industry, and in return takes away the fruits of the soil. Thirty persons, men, women, old people, and children, at the time of our visit composed this little society, as yet scarcely formed, an opening seed thrown upon the wilderness, there to germinate. Chance, interest, or inclination, had collected them in this narrow space. No common link existed between them, and they differed widely. Among them were Canadians, Americans, Indians, and half-castes. Philosophers have thought that human nature is everywhere the same, varied only according to the laws and institutions of different states of society. This is one of the opinions to which every page of history gives the lie. Nations, under all circumstances, have their peculiar physiognomy and their characteristic features, as well as individuals. Laws, manners, and religion may alter, wealth and power may change, places, dress, and external appearance may differ, prejudices may disappear, or be substituted by others. In the midst of these diversities, 
you still recognize the same race. Though human nature is flexible, it contains elements that are fixed. The inhabitants of this little oasis belong to two nations which for more than a century have occupied the same country and obeyed the same laws. Yet they have nothing in common. They still are as distinctly English and French as if they lived on the banks of the Seine and the Thames. Within yonder trellised hut you will find a man whose cordial welcome and open countenance show immediately a taste for social pleasures and careless indifference to life. At first, you may take him for an Indian. Forced to submit to savage life, he has willingly adopted its dress, its customs, and almost its morals, he wears moccasins, an otter skin cap and a blanket. He is an indefatigable hunter, he sleeps under arms and lives on wild honey and bison's flesh. This man is, nevertheless, still French. He is gay, adventurous, proud of his origin, passionately fond of military glory, vainer, then selfish, the creature of impulse rather than of judgment, preferring renown to wealth. In order to fly to the wilderness, he has broken every social tie. He has neither wife nor children. He may not like this, but he easily submits to it, as he does to everything else. By nature, his tastes are domestic. He loves his own fireside and the sight of the steeple of his village. But he was torn from his peaceful occupations, his imagination fired by novel scenes, another hemisphere became his home, and he was suddenly seized with an insatiable desire for violent emotions, vicissitudes and perils. The most civilized of Europeans is now a worshipper of savage life. He prefers the savanna to the street, the chase to the plow. He sports with life, and never thinks of the future. The white men from France, said the Canadian Indians, are as good hunters as we are. They despise the conveniences of life and brave danger and death as we do, God created them to live in the hut of the savage and to dwell in the wilderness. A few steps off live another European who, exposed to the same difficulties, has hardened himself against them. This man is cold unyielding and disputatious. He devotes himself to his land and submits to savage life only so far as is necessary. He is always fighting against it, and every day strips it of some of its attributes. He imports one by one into the wilderness his laws, his manners and customs, and as much as possible every detail of advanced civilization. The emigrant, from the United States cares only for the results of victory. Glory is to him an empty name, and he considers that man is born only to obtain fortune and comfort. He is brave, but his bravery is the result of calculation, brave because he has discovered that there are many things harder to bear than death, though an adventurer he is surrounded by a wily, and yet cares little for intellectual or social enjoyments. Encamped on the other side of the river, amid the beds of the Saginaw, the Indian from time to time casts a stoical glance on the habitations of his brothers from Europe. Do not think that he admires their industry or envies their lot. Though for nearly 300 years civilization has invaded and surrounded the American savage, he has not yet learned to know or to appreciate his enemy. In vain, in both races, is one generation followed by another. Like two parallel rivers, they have flowed for three centuries side by side towards the same ocean, only, a narrow space divides them, but their waters do not mingle. It is not natural talent that is wanting in the aborigines of the new world, but their nature seems obstinate to repel our ideas and our arts. From the interior of his smoky hut, wrapped in his blanket, the Indian contemplates with scorn the convenient dwelling of the European. He has a proud satisfaction in his poverty, his heart swells and triumphs in his barbarous independence. He smiles bitterly when he sees us wear out our lives in heaping up useless riches. What we term industry he calls shameful subjection. He compares the workman to the ox toiling on in a furrow, what we call necessaries of life, he terms childish playthings or womanish baubles. He envies us only with our arms. If a man has a leafy hut to shelter his head by night, a good fire to warm him in winter and to banish the mosquitoes in summer if he has good dogs and plenty of game, what more can he ask of the great spirit? On the opposite bank of the Saginaw, near the European clearings, on the frontier that separates the old from the new world, rises a hut, more convenient than the wigwam of the savage, ruder than the house of the civilized man, it is the dwelling of a half-caste. When for the first time we presented ourselves at the door of this half-barbarous cabin, we were surprised at hearing a soft voice from within chanting the penitential psalms to an Indian air. We stopped a moment to listen. The sounds were slowly modulated and deeply melancholy, 
it was easy to recognize the plaintive harmony which characterizes the songs of the wilderness. We entered, the owner was absent. Seated cross-legged on a mat, in the middle of the room, was a young woman making moccasins. With her foot, she rocked an infant, whose copper hue and European features announced a mixed origin. She was dressed like one of our peasants, except that her feet were bare and her hair fell unbound over her shoulders. When she saw us, she left off and looked at us with a mixture of fear and respect. We asked her if she were French. No, she replied with a smile. English? No, neither, dropping her eyes, she added, I'm only a savage. Child of both races, taught to use two languages, brought up in different creeds and nursed in opposite prejudices, the half-caste forms a compound it's inexplicable to himself as to others. The ideas currently in the world when reflected in his confused brain, seem to him inextricable chaos from which he can find no escape. Proud of his European origin, he despises the wilderness, and yet loves its savage freedom, he admires civilization, but cannot completely submit to its restraints. His tastes contradict his ideas, his convictions are opposed to his habits. Unable to guide his steps by the uncertain light of his reason, his mind struggles painfully in the toils of universal doubt, he adopts opposite customs, he prays at two altars, he believes in the Redeemer of the world and in the amulets of the juggler, and he arrives at the term of his days without having been able to solve the mystery of his existence. Thus, in this unknown corner of the earth, providence has sowed the seeds of diverse nations. Already many distinct races are to be found here side by side. A few exiles from the great human family have met in these vast forests. They have the same wants. They have to resist wild animals, hunger, and rough weather. Scarcely thirty of them are collected in one spot in this intractable wilderness, and they look upon each other with nothing but hatred and suspicion. Diversity of color, poverty or comfort, ignorance or cultivation, have already set up amongst them ineffaceable distinctions. National prejudices, and those of education and birth, divide and isolate them. Thus a narrow frame contains a complete picture of the contemptible side of our nature. Still, one feature is wanting. The strong lines of demarcation, traced by birth and prejudice, are not confined to the present life. They reach beyond the grave. Six different religions, or sects, share the faith of this infant society. Catholicism, with its formidable immutability, its absolute dogmas, its terrible anathemas, and its vast rewards, the reformed faith, with its movement and continual changes, and even the old paganism, all find here their disciples. They adore in different ways the one eternal being who made man in his own image. They fight for the heaven to which each sect claims to be exclusively entitled. Even amidst the privations of exile, and actual suffering, a man exhausts his imagination in conceiving indescribable horrors for the future. The Lutheran damns the Calvinist, the Calvinist the Unitarian, and the Catholic includes them all in one common reprobation. More tolerant in his rude faith, the Indian is content with excluding his European brother from the happy hunting fields reserved for himself. Constant to the traditions bequeathed to him by his ancestors, he easily consoles himself for the evils of life and dies dreaming of the ever-verdant forest untouched by the axe of the pioneer, where he will chase the deer and the beaver through the unnumbered days of eternity. After breakfast, we went to see the richest landowner in the village, Mr. Williams. We found him in his shop engaged in selling to the Indians a number of little articles of small value, such as knives, glass necklaces, earrings, and so forth. It was sad to see how these poor creatures were treated by their civilized brother from Europe. All, however, whom we saw there were ready to do justice to the savages. They were kind, inoffensive, a thousand times less given to stealing than the whites. It was only a pity that they were beginning to understand the value of things. But why a pity? Because trade with them became every day less profitable. Is not the superiority of civilized man appears in this remark? The Indian in his ignorant simplicity would have said, that he found it every day more difficult to cheat his neighbor, but the white man finds in the refinement of language, a shade which expresses the fact, and yet saves his conscience. On our return from Mr. Williams, we went a short way up the Saginaw to shoot wild ducks. A canoe left the reeds, and its Indian occupants came up to us to examine my double-barreled gun. This weapon, which is common enough, always attracted special attention from the savages. A gun that can kill two men in a second, can be fired in the wet and damp, was to them a marvel, 
a masterpiece beyond all price. These men showed, as usual, great admiration. They asked whence my gun came. Our young guide replied, that it was made on the other side of the great water, where the fathers of the Canadians lived, and, as may be supposed, this answer did not make it less precious in their eyes. They remarked, however, that, as the aim was not in the center of the barrel, it could not be sure an observation which, I own, I could not answer. When evening came, we returned to our canoe, and trusting to the experience that we had acquired in the morning, we rode, unaccompanied, up an arm of the Saginaw, of which we had had only a glimpse. The sky was without a cloud, the atmosphere pure and still. The river watered an immense forest, it flowed so gently that we could scarcely tell the direction of the current. We always thought that to have an accurate idea of the American forests, we ought to follow the course of some of their rivers. These rivers are the great highways with which Providence has pierced the wilderness and rendered it accessible to man. In the roads cut through the woods, the view is circumscribed, and the path itself is the work of human hands. Rivers do not show the traces of human labor, and you see freely the grandeur of the wild and luxurious vegetation of their banks. The wilderness was before us just as, six thousand years ago, it showed itself to the fathers of mankind. It was a delicious, blooming, perfumed, gorgeous dwelling, a living palace made for man, though, as yet, the owner had not taken possession. The canoe gilded noiselessly and without effort. All was quiet and serene. We ourselves soon felt softened by the scene. Our words became fewer and fewer, our voices sank to a whisper, at last, we lapsed into silence, and, raising our oars, we each fell into a peaceful and inexpressibly delicious reverie. How is it that language, which finds an equivalent for every sorrow, is incapable of expressing the simplest and sweetest emotions? How is it possible adequately to describe those rare moments when the luxury of sensation leads to mental calm and universal harmony seems to pervade creation, when the mind, only half awake, fluctuates between the present and the future, the actual and the possible, when, amidst the exquisite repose of nature, inhaling the soft still air, a man listens to the even beating of his own heart, every pulse marking the lapse of time flowing drop by drop into eternity. Many men may have added one year to another of long life without once having felt anything resembling what I have just described. They will not understand me. But there are others, I am sure, who will fill up my sketch from their hearts and memories, and in whom these lines will awaken the remembrance of some fleeting hours which neither time nor the real cares of life have been able to obliterate. The report of a gun in the woods roused us from our dream. At first it sounded like an explosion on both sides of the river, the roar then grew fainter, till it was lost in the depth of the surrounding forest. It sounded like the prolonged and fearful war cry of advancing civilization. One evening in Sicily we lost ourselves in the extensive marsh, the site of the ancient Himera. The impression produced on us by the wilderness, all that was left of that famous city, was deep and strong. It was a striking testimony to the instability of human creations, and to the imperfection of human nature. Here also was solitude, but the imagination, instead of recurring to the past, sprang forward, and lost itself in a boundless future. We asked ourselves, by what singular fate it happened that we, to whom it had been granted to look on the ruins of extinct empires and tread the wilderness made by human hands, we children of an ancient people, should be called on to witness this scene of the primitive world to contemplate the as yet unoccupied cradle of a great nation. These are not the more or less probable speculations of philosophy. The facts are as certain as if they had already taken place. In a few years these impenetrable forests will have fallen, the sons of civilization and industry will break the silence of the Saginaw, its echoes will cease, the banks will be imprisoned by keys, its current, which now flows on unnoticed and tranquil through a nameless waste, will be stemmed by the prows of vessels. More than 100 miles sever the solitude from the great European settlements, and we were, perhaps, the last travelers allowed to see its primitive grandeur. So strong is the impetus that urges the white man to the entire conquest of the new world. It is this idea of destruction, with the accompanying thought of near and inevitable change, that gives to the solitudes of America their peculiar character and their touching loveliness. You look at them with mournful pleasure. You feel that you must not delay admiring them. The impression of wild and natural greatness so soon to expire mingles with the lofty thoughts to which the progress of civilization gives rise, you are proud of being a man, and yet you reflect, 
almost with remorse, on the dominion which providence allots to you over nature. You are distracted by conflicting ideas and feelings. But every impression received is sublime and leaves a deep trace. We wished to quit Saginaw on the next day, the 27th of July, but one of our horses was galled by the saddle, and we resolved to remain a day longer. To pass the time, we shot over the prairies which border the Saginaw below the clearings. These prairies are not marshy as might have been expected. They are more, or less extensive plains on which no tree grows, though the soil is excellent, the grass is dry and springs to a height of three or four feet. We found a little game, and we came back early. The heat was stifling as if a storm were in the air, and the mosquitoes more annoying than usual. As we walked we were enveloped in a cloud of these insects and had to fight our way. Woe betide the loiterer he is abandoned to a merciless enemy. I remember being forced to load my gun running, it was so painful to stand still for an instant. As we were returning across the prairie we remarked that our Canadian guide followed a narrow path, and looked very carefully where he placed his feet. Why are you so cautious? I said, are you afraid of the damp? No, he replied, but when I walk in the prairie I have acquired the habit of always looking at my feet lest I should tread on a rattlesnake. Devil! I exclaimed, with a start, are there any rattlesnakes here? Oh yes, indeed. Answered my American Norman with perfect indifference, the place is full of them. I found fault with him for not telling us sooner, he declared that as we were well shod, and the rattlesnake never bites above the heel, he did not think that we ran at any great danger. I asked him if the bite of the rattlesnake was mortal, he replied, always in less than twenty-four hours, unless recourse is had to the Indians. They know of a remedy which, given in time, saves the patient. However, that might be, during the rest of the way we imitated our guide, and looked, as he did, at our feet. The night which followed this burning day was one of the most disagreeable that I ever passed. The mosquitoes had become so troublesome, that though overpowered with fatigue, I could not close my eyes. Towards midnight the storm which had long been threatening broke. As there was no longer any hope of sleeping, I rose and went to the door of our hut to breathe the cool night air. The rain had not begun. The air seemed still. But the forest was already in motion, from time to time a deep sigh or a long cry escaped from it. Now and then a flash of lightning illuminated the sky. The gentle flow of the Saginaw, the little clearing on each side of its banks, the roofs of five or six huts, and the belt of trees that surrounded us, appeared then for a moment like a revelation of the future, all vanished again in perfect darkness, and the awful voice of the wilderness was once more heard. I was looking with emotion at this grand spectacle when I heard a sigh close to me, and the lightning showed to me an Indian leaning, as I was, against the wall of our dwelling. No doubt the storm had disturbed him, for he cast a fixed and perturbed glance on all around. Was he afraid of the lightning? Or, could he see in the shock of the elements something beyond a passing convulsion of nature? Those fleeting pictures of civilization springing up, as it were, of themselves in the wilderness, were they to him prophetic? Those sobs of the forest which seemed to struggle in unequal combat, did they reach his ears like a secret warning from heaven, a solemn revelation of the fate finally reserved for the savage races? It was impossible to say. But his trembling lips appeared to murmur a prayer and his features were stamped with superstitious terror. At 5 a.m. we resolved to start. Every Indian from the neighborhood of Saginaw had disappeared. They were gone to receive the annual presents from the English, the Europeans were engaged in the harvest. We were, therefore, obliged to make up our minds to recross the forest without a guide. The undertaking was not so arduous as it might appear. In general, there is but one path through these vast wildernesses, if you do not lose sight of it you must reach your journey's end. So, at five, we recrossed the Saginaw. We received the farewell and last advice of our host, and turning our horses' heads, found ourselves alone in the forest. I own that it was not without a solemn sensation that we began again to penetrate its damp recesses. The forest stretched behind us to the Pole and to the Pacific. But one inhabited spot was between us and the boundless wilderness, and we had just quitted it. These thoughts, however, made us only press on our horses, and in three hours we reached a wilderness's wigwam on the lonely banks of the river Cass. A grassy bank overhanging the water, shaded by large trees, served for a table, and we breakfasted, looking on the reaches of the river, which wound among the trees as clear as crystal. 
On leaving the wigwam, we found several paths. We had been told which we were to take. But such directions are not always full or precise. We had been told of two paths, there were three. It was true that of these three roads two, farther on, joined together in one, but of this, we were not aware, and our perplexity was great. After due examination and discussion, we could think of nothing better than to throw the bridle on our horses next to leave them to solve the difficulty. In this way, we forded the river as well as we could and were carried rapidly in a southwesterly direction. More than once the roads became nearly invisible in the brushwood. In other places the path appeared so untraveled, that we could hardly believe that it led to more than an abandoned wigwam, our compass indeed showed that we were proceeding in the right direction, yet we were not completely reassured till we reached the spot where we had dined three days before. We knew it again by a gigantic pine, whose trunk, shattered by the wind, we had before admired. Still, we rode on with undiminished speed, for the sun was getting low. Soon we reached the clearing which usually betokens a settlement. As night was coming on, we came in sight of the river Flint, half an hour later we were at the door of our house. This time the bear received us like old friends and rose up on his hind legs to greet our happy return. During the whole day, we had not met a single human face, the animals, too, had disappeared. No doubt they had retired from the heat. All that we saw, and that at rare intervals, was now and then, on the bare top of a withered tree, a solitary hawk standing motionless on one leg, and sleeping quietly in the sun as it cut out of the wood on which he was resting. In this absolute solitude, our thoughts suddenly recurred to the revolution of 1830, the first anniversary of which fell on this day. I cannot describe the violence with which the recollection of the 29th of July seized my mind. The cries and the smoke of the battle, the booming of the cannon, the rattle of musketry, the still more awful peal of the toxin, that whole day enveloped in its flaming atmosphere, seemed suddenly to rise out of the past and become a living picture before my eyes. It was as instantaneous as it was vivid, bleeding as a dream, for when I lifted my head and looked around me, the vision had disappeared. But the silence of the forest had never struck me as so frigid, the shadows as so black, or the solitude so absolute. This concludes our special edition story of Alexis de Tocqueville's A Fortnight in the Wilderness. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Thumb Wind's End of the Road podcast. If you like this kind of story, you are invited to join other monthly visitors on our website at thumbwind.com. Please watch for and download the next special story that covers an amazing settler, Jacob Parkhurst, who lived in the Ohio Valley in the late 1700s. It's an amazing tale of survival and life in pioneer America. Please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and give us a review. From the end of the road. Have a great day.